Hello, and welcome to HUD's Office of Policy Development and Research's quarterly update, focusing on the whole of government approach to the eviction crisis. This is our final update of 2021, and we are delighted to be able to bring these briefings to you on a regular basis. My name is Peter Kahn, and I am a member of the Office of Policy Development within PDNR, and I will be your host for this afternoon's briefing. Over the course of the next hour and 45 minutes, we will have our traditional overview of U.S. housing market conditions, a new data segment referencing Census Pulse survey data, a keynote address by Margaret Hagan, followed by a panel discussion moderated by Margaret. During the panel discussion, you are invited to submit questions using Zoom's Q&A feature. Our team will be monitoring the Q&A throughout the session, and we will get to as many of your questions as possible. Our moderator will have the latitude to interject questions during the panel discussion, or may choose to hold questions until the end of the panel. Two other housekeeping notes. First, if you are commenting via social media regarding today's session, please use the hashtag PDRUpdate. Second, today's session is being recorded and will be posted to our website, hudusr.gov, once post-production is complete. And now, please join me in welcoming Ben Winter, PDNR's Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy Development, for his opening thoughts on today's briefing. Good afternoon. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Um, so every quarter we host these events so that HUD stakeholders uh, have the opportunity to learn all about the current status of our nation's housing market uh, and so that you can hear directly from your housing market economists. And I say your economists because these folks here in PDNR are dedicated public servants uh, that are passionate about serving you, the American people, uh, finding new ways to use data about our nation's complex and diverse housing market uh, in the policymaking process here at HUD. Uh, so thank you to Kevin Kane and Veronica Helms for sharing your insights with us today. Uh, also every quarter, we do a deeper dive on our particular policy topic that keeps us really busy here at HUD. And this quarter, we've assembled a really fantastic panel to talk about eviction prevention. Uh, which in many ways I think speaks to the core of HUD's mission. Even though eviction prevention has not always been an explicit function of the federal government. Instead, that policy domain has really lied within the purview of state and local governments. But this pandemic has clearly underscored why housing stability matters at a national level. It shined a light on the inequities uh, of the eviction process for people of color and disadvantaged communities. And it helped us truly understand at the federal level how frustrating it is uh, at the local level to service providers and landlords alike uh, that we don't have a national infrastructure for efficiently and effectively preventing evictions. Uh, but most importantly, I think this pandemic has underscored how important it is to expand our nation's housing safety net to promote healthy outcomes and economic opportunity for everybody so we can realize a more resilient and equitable nation coming out of this crisis, uh, which is why the president's Build Back Better initiative has such a strong housing pillar to it. So we have learned a lot this past year. During the pandemic, HUD has been an important partner to the interagency whole of government approach to prevent evictions that the White House has been leading with other federal agencies like Treasury, Department of Justice, and CFPB. Uh, you'll learn more about these initiatives later on in the panel. We're also going to discuss uh, what we know about the impacts of evictions on households. We're going to talk about some of the best practices for delivering services on the ground, but we're also going to talk about gaps in our knowledge about evictions and how to address them. And those gaps are exactly where HUD's Office of Policy Development and Research is all about. That's where we thrive in. Uh, conversations like these will help us further develop HUD's research agenda around evictions and housing instability, and will help our continued collaboration with other agencies to think about what role the federal government should play going forward in this really important policy space. Uh, so without further ado, I am going to kick it off by introducing Kevin Kane, your Chief Housing Market Economist. Uh, Kevin, can you tell us a little bit about how our housing market is doing this quarter? All right. Thank you very much, Ben. Appreciate that. 
Uh, and so I thought for uh, this special kind of holiday edition here of the PDNR update, uh, we're going to do a, a seven hour deep dive, taking a look at the economic impact of COVID on Santa Claus and the economy of the North Pole. Uh, actually, just kidding. Uh, we are going to be looking at the, uh, the nation's uh, sales and rental markets uh, and a brief look at the nation's economy. Uh, although uh, I'm not going to talk for, uh, for seven hours, it may feel like seven hours by the time I'm done. Uh, so before I start, as always, I want to give a special thanks to Randall Goodnight and Marissa Dolan, uh, two of our field economists around the country, uh, who put together uh, all of the maps that you're going to see in my presentation this afternoon. Uh, we try to be consistent with the color themes uh, of the maps, where brown indicates worse off conditions or declines in a variable, uh, and blue indicates better conditions or increases. Uh, so let's start by looking at the nation's economy. Uh, so here we see in this figure, the monthly job totals for the past two years. Uh, and this is on a non-seasonally adjusted basis. Uh, so jobs peaked at around 151 million jobs in February of last year, and we lost 21 million jobs in March and April. Uh, by the end of November, the economy had 150 million jobs. Uh, and so we have recovered 95% of the jobs lost uh, during those two months. Uh, in this next map, uh, we see the change in non-farm payrolls during the third quarter of 2021 relative to a year ago. Uh, so the national change uh, was an increase of 4.6%, uh, and that compares with a loss of 6.9% a year ago. Uh, jobs were up in every region of the country, and you can see here the whole country shown in blue. Uh, the five regions that are in darker blue uh, increased by faster than the national average, uh, and that was led by the Pacific up 5.9% and New England up 5.7%. Uh, the slowest rate of growth occurred in the Great Plains at 3%. And to give a kind of an overview of housing market conditions around the country, uh, sales markets are generally tight around the country right now. Uh, just kind of as a bit of background for that, uh, balanced conditions exist when the quantity of housing supplied equals the quantity demanded. Uh, soft markets occur when the quantity of housing supplied exceeds the quantity uh, demanded and we have a surplus and tight conditions uh, exist when demand exceeds supply and we have a housing shortage. Uh, all three home price indices show that home sales prices were up approximately 18 to 20% from a year ago, uh, and that's as of uh, September of this year. Uh, home sales were up by 15% during the 12 months ending uh, September, uh, and that's based on Zonda data. Uh, apartment market conditions are also tight around much of the country and tightening. Uh, according to real page data, the national apartment vacancy rate was 2.7%. Uh, rents were up by 12.5%, uh, and those uh, data elements as of September. Uh, the number of multifamily units permitted was up by 33% from a year ago. And taking a look at conditions uh, around the, the 10 different HUD regions, uh, these are assessments that are provided to us by our field economists. Relative to last quarter, uh, improvements in an area are shaded in blue uh, and declines are, are shaded in brown. Uh, and so you'll see there's no, no blue areas this time around. Uh, on the sales side, uh, again, conditions generally seem to be tight around the country. Uh, previously balanced conditions in uh, New England and New York, New, New Jersey, as well as the Great Plains, the Pacific and the Northwest, uh, they've all uh, tightened. And on the apartment side, uh, apartment market conditions are generally tight around the country. Uh, once again, uh, New England, New York, New Jersey, they've seen uh, their markets uh, start to tighten as well relative to last quarter. Here we see the uh, three different home price indices, uh, the S&P Shiller Index, the FHFA Index, uh, and the CoreLogic Index, all showing home price uh, increases relative to a year ago. Uh, in September, the S&P Case-Shiller Index had an increase of 20%, while the FHFA and the CoreLogic Index were both up by 18%. And if we look at the, the far right of that figure, uh, those, those most recent numbers, you know, we start to question, maybe we've reached a peak in terms of, of the price increases. You know, it looks like things may be leveling off and, and uh, we've possibly hit that peak, so we will see moving forward. Uh, in this map now, we take a look at the year-over-year -year change in the CoreLogic Home Price Index as of September. 
Uh, nationally, again, home prices up by 18% based on the core logic index, uh, with uh, that compares with an increase of 7% a year ago. Uh, prices increased in all uh, states, so you can see every state shown here in blue. Uh, states in the two darkest shades of blue increased by more than the national average, and that was led by 30% gains in Idaho and Arizona, uh, and prices were up by double digits in 47 states. Uh, the smallest gains occurred in D.C. up 5% and North Dakota, where prices were up by 8%. Uh, price growth accelerated in all states except for the District of Columbia, where it remained uh, steady relative to last year. Uh, on a metropolitan level, prices were also up uh, in every metro area, ranging from an increase of 4% to an increase of 35%. Based on Zonda data, total home sales increased by 15% during the 12 months ending September. Uh, gains occurred in the whole country. Uh, and so we see every region here shown in blue. Uh, the darker blue were up by more than the national change led by the Pacific with an increase of 27%. Uh, the Southeast where sales were up by 20%. Uh, the smallest gain of 4% occurred in the Great Plains. And here we've got a, a double feature map. Uh, this is looking at uh, month supply data. Uh, typically a balanced market has about six months of inventory that's available for sale. The left map shows the current months of supply across the HUD regions. Uh, nationally, there was a 1.4 months supply of inventory. That's down from 2.2 months a year ago and 3.2 months uh, two years ago. Uh, the regions that are at or below the national level are shown in brown, and you can see that that's uh, mostly the western part of the country, uh, while the blue regions are above the national rate. Uh, the highest months of supply is 2.6 months in New York, New Jersey, with the lowest of 0.8 months in the Great Plains. Uh, the change in the month supply is shown on the right map. Uh, declines occurred in every region. We can see the whole country now in brown, uh, with the national decline averaging 0.8 months. Uh, that compares with a one-month decline a year ago. Uh, darker brown regions are down by more than the national average, led by a 1.7 month decline in New York, New Jersey. Now let's take a look at building activity around the country. Uh, on the left map, uh, we look at single family building and the right map is showing us multifamily building. Uh, so on the single family side, uh, the uh, single family building permits decreased by 3% during the third quarter relative to a year ago. Uh, the number of homes permitted declined in nine regions, uh, those shown in brown, with the declines greater than the national average uh, in almost all of those regions, except for New York, New, York, New Jersey, uh, which was down by 1%. Uh, the number of homes permitted was up by 7% uh, in the southeast. In the right map, uh, we're looking at multifamily permitting, and in the nation, multifamily permitting was up by 33% in the third quarter relative to a year ago. Uh, and an interesting thing to note that multifamily permitting uh, accounted for 39% of all units permitted in the third quarter. Uh, that compares with uh, accounting for 32% a year ago. So a little bit more emphasis on multifamily permitting uh, rather than single family permitting when we think of overall construction. Uh, multifamily permitting was up in eight regions, uh, those shown in blue with the dark blue areas up by more than the national average. And increases were led by the Rocky Mountains at 90%, followed by 76% in the Northwest. And so for the next three maps, we're gonna look at uh, the, the rental markets. And on the left side, you'll see the regional focus on the right side, uh, looking at uh, the metropolitan area. Uh, so this first set of maps is looking at the vacancy rates across the country. And according to RealPage data, the apartment vacancy rate in the United States was 2.7% in September. Uh, that's down from 4.2% a year ago. And the three regions in blue had a vacancy rate that was above the national average, uh, led by 3.7% in the Southwest. Uh, the seven regions in brown were at or below the national average with the lowest rate of 2.2% in the Pacific and 2.3% in New England. Uh, at the metropolitan level, 95% of the 300 areas that are covered by RealPage had a vacancy rate below 5%. Uh, 
And large metro areas around the country with low vacancy rates include San Diego, Anaheim, uh, and Riverside San Bernardino, uh, each with a vacancy rate of one and a half percent or below. Uh, this next set of maps now shows the change in the vacancy rate. Uh, again, according to real page data, the national apartment vacancy rate was down by 1.6 percentage points from a year ago. Vacancy rates were down in all 10 regions, uh, again, all shown in brown, with the darker brown regions down by more than the national decline. Uh, the largest decline uh, were, occurred in the Southwest, uh, where the vacancy rate was down by two percentage points, and then followed by the Northwest down by 1.8 percentage points. Uh, of the 300 areas covered by RealPage, vacancy rates declined in 85% of those areas. Um, and those, again, shown in brown. Uh, the two darker shades of brown were down by more than the national average. And so finally, we'll look at the change in rents across the country. Uh, and rents were up by 12.5% nationally, according to the real page data in September, uh, relative to September of last year. Uh, and that compares with a slight decline in rents a year ago. From 2014 through 2009, just to kind of give a little bit of perspective, uh, rents increased by an average of 4.6% annually. Uh, rents in September were up in all HUD regions, and so the entire country is shown here in blue, uh, with the darker blue regions up by more than the national average. The largest increase occurred in the southeast, uh, up 19.3%, followed by 14.9% in the Rocky Mountains. And on the metropolitan level, uh, rents were up in 296 out of the 300 areas covered by RealPage. Uh, the two darker shades of blue were up by more than the national average, and larger metro areas with an increase of 25% or more included West Palm Beach, uh, Boise, and Phoenix. And then in New York and San Francisco, the two biggest rental markets in the country, uh, rents were up by 11 and 3% respectively. And now we've got a little bit of a bonus map here. Uh, this map uh, using the household pulse survey data that you're going to hear about shortly. Uh, we took a look at the percentage of households that are not currently caught up on their rent payments at the state level. Uh, nationally, the average was 15%, and states in blue are below the national average and brown are above. Uh, the highest percentages are in the southwest and in the southeast, uh, and there are seven states uh, in the two darkest shades of brown that have 21% or more of their households behind on rent, uh, and that includes Rhode Island, Kentucky, Florida, Oklahoma, Texas, uh, Delaware, and Georgia. So in summary, uh, jobs were up 4.6% in the third quarter relative to a year ago. Uh, sales markets are tight around the country with home prices up 18 to 20% uh, and sales up by 15%. Uh, apartment market conditions are also tight. Uh, rents were up 12.5% and the vacancy rate was down by 1.6 percentage points. So for additional information, uh, you can please go to the U.S. Housing Market Conditions website. Uh, it's on huduser.gov. You can talk with your local regional or field economist, uh, or you can feel free to reach out to me. Uh, and now at this point, it is my pleasure to hand things over to Veronica Helms Garrison, uh, an analyst in PDNR's Program Monitoring and Research Division who's gonna discuss the Census Household Pulse Survey in greater detail. So thank you very much. Thanks, Kevin. And I, I resent having to follow you. You make uh, a technical topic very digestible um, and it's much appreciated. Um, so I'm gonna talk today about Pulse Survey findings, specifically housing security during the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. So I want to talk a little bit about this survey, which is super exciting um, and innovative. So this was an experimental survey in response to um, the COVID-19 pandemic, and it was really designed to quickly collect data on how people's lives have been impacted by the pandemic. Um, and it's a great 
survey because it's really in collaboration with multiple federal partners. So USDA manages questions on food insecurity, HUD proposes questions on housing insecurity or housing in general. Um, health partners obviously um, have been putting forward questions on vaccines and vaccine hesitancy. Um, and it's been a really great kind of all of government collaboration to really think about the social and economic impacts of the coronavirus. Um, the survey was first employed on April 23rd, uh, 2020, so a little bit after um, when all of the lockdown started. Um, and the data release works in the sense that it goes to federal partners first, and then a week later it's released in public files or tables, and then in a week later it's released in public files. Um, and so federal agencies have a little bit of a lead to kind of anticipate um, what the data is looking like. And the survey has gone through many iterations. Um, we're currently in phase 3.3, which started in December one, on December 1. Um, and moving forward, it looks like it'll be a monthly release, but um, I think there, or there's still uh, room to work through it. I think that's part of the great thing about this survey is it's adaptable um, and constantly changing. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna talk specifically about the housing questions. Um, there are a few questions that have been in the survey through since April of 2020. So that's questions about tenure, um, questions about building type, which were added later on, confidence to pay, how confident are you that the household will be able to pay next rent or mortgage on time. Um, and then there's also questions specific to renters and homeowners about being behind on rent and fear of eviction or foreclosure. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, this survey has constantly been changed and adapted based on kind of needs, what we were seeing. Um, in phase two, we added household level weights um, and the question about behind on rent actually changed. So previously during phase one, the question was, did you pay your last month's rent or mortgage on time? And HUD recognized that you may not pay on time, but you still may pay. Um, so we changed the question to, is this household currently caught up on rent or mortgage payments, depending on whether it was a renter or homeowner. Um, and those changes really took place in August, 2020 moving forward. Um, so a lot of the maps or graphs that I'm gonna show are only gonna be from that period. Um, and as I mentioned, we also have been adding questions as, as items have been rolling out. So for example, how many months behind is your household in paying rent or mortgage? This has allowed us to kind of try to estimate how much uh, money is, is being left out. Um, and then emergency rental assistance, has anyone in your household applied for um, or received? So we're trying to kind of compare those numbers to treasury administrative data as well. Next slide, please. So the most recent data release was week 39. Um, it was a data collection period from September 29th to October 11th. Um, it estimated that among uh, renter households, about 15.5% reported being behind on rent. And again, the question was, is this household currently caught up on rent or mortgage payments? We estimate this translates to about 6.94 million renter households. On average, we find that folks are about 2.5 months behind on rent. Um, and among all U.S. renters, we see that about 7% are fearful of imminent eviction, which is about 3 million renter households, or about half of those who are behind on rent. Using that months behind metric that I spoke about earlier, we estimate that uh, the total rental arrears amount among renter households is about $18.4 billion in back owed rent. Um, and just to give a little context to this, pre-pandemic in the American Housing Survey, we saw that about 2.8 million renter households were at least one month behind on rent, and about 3.3 million renter households feared imminent eviction. Next slide, please. So this slide, and I apologize that some of the um, lettering is a little off, um, is the estimated number of U.S. renters not confident in their ability to, to pay their next rental payment on time. And again, this is one of the questions that has been in the survey throughout the entirety of it. Um, and I don't know about y'all, but in the pandemic, I kind of lost sense of time. Um, and I was looking through these numbers, I was saying what was happening um, during the pandemic and what was going on once we saw some of these spikes. So I went and there are some really interesting uh, COVID timelines and I kind of compared some of those key dates to what we were seeing a spike. Uh, so when we first see this first spike of 6.4 million, um, that was when Dr. Fauci testified to the US Senate um, that the death toll was likely underestimated um, and that we would likely see more deaths. 
Um, the second spike here, this 5.8%, that's when the WHO announced that COVID could become airborne. Um, and they had really confirmed it with a letter from over 200 scientists um, really uh, agreeing to this uh, uh, announcement. And then here, the 6.5, I want to point out, this is right when the FDA approved the amuse, emergency use authorization for Pfizer. Moderna was a couple days later, um, but this is when vaccination of healthcare workers began. So you can really see that that really helped to kind of ease some of the um, confidence and ability to pay rent. Next slide, please. So this um, is the estimated number of renters behind on rental payments. This again has a very similar curve. Um, and again, the previous graph started in April of 2020. This starts in August of 2020. Um, so we see a peak um, right around that kind of December um, 2020 uh, 20 time period. Next slide, please. And again, this is um, the if households who are fearing imminent eviction, and we are seeing, again, similar trends. We see that a lot of these are all aligning with each other. And again, we see a peak um, kind of around that, that particular time period. Next slide, please. Um, and as others have mentioned, there are pretty significant housing disparities based on income, race, ethnicity, housing assistance status. Um, and here in PDNR, we're doing our best to try to quantify um, these whenever possible. Next slide, please. So um, for uh, updates on this data, we're now including it in the Housing Market Indicators monthly update, um, which is available online. It'll look like this. Um, and uh, I appreciate your time and uh, thanks for having me. Next slide, please. I will now pass the conversation to Peter Kahn, PDNR's Associate Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy Development. Thank you, Veronica, and thank you to Kevin. It is now my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Margaret Hagan. Dr. Hagan is a lawyer and a designer currently based at Stanford University. Dr. Hagan is the executive director of the Legal Design Lab at Stanford Law School. Her work focuses on bringing design into the world of law to create a new generation of accessible, engaging legal services. Dr. Hagan is an eviction systems and solution expert who, with the League of Cities, created the eviction Prevention Learning Lab, a cohort of 30 cities working on eviction. She is the acting chair of the American Bar Association's Task Force on Eviction Prevention, Housing Stability, and Equity. The task force includes people with lived, lived experiences of eviction, as well as the American Bar Association's Real Property section. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Margaret Hagan as our keynote speaker and panel moderator. Thank you so much. Just a second, let me share my screen. There we go. So today I'm going to be talking about the eviction crisis, what we know about it, and what can be done to reduce its harms. So I'll first go over some points, um, many of them echoing what's already been brought up about what we know about the scale of the eviction crisis in the US and who it affects most. So in uh, 2017, uh, when we had one of the um, last um, points of data about risk of eviction before COVID, we could see that 2.8 million households were at risk based on their cost burdens, the amount of rent that they owed vis-a-vis -vis their income, and the amount of rental assistance or affordable housing support they could get. Um, and in 2016, there were an estimated 900,000 formal evictions going through the US court system with 2.3 million people evicted. In addition to these numbers of formal evictions, we also have to recognize that there are hard to track informal evictions that happen outside of the courts that are much harder to get data about. During COVID, this risk of eviction has been increasing as was just mentioned in the wonderful data reports. So as of mid-2021, we could see that 15 million people were at risk of eviction based on their rent burden, their cost burden of their household, with an average of about $3,000 owed to their landlord. People of color and families are at higher risk of eviction. Um, if we look at especially Black and Latino households, um, they are usually more cost burdened and more fearful of being um, evicted. And we see that in studies throughout the past decade. 
that in neighborhoods that are more Black and Latino, there is a heightened risk of eviction, especially for households with families and that are headed by low-income women. We have to think about eviction in the broader context and the downstream consequences that come with either being forced to leave your home, with having an eviction lawsuit filed against you and that record in the court, or having an eviction order lodged against you um, and that record being in the court. These factors affect people's and families' long-term outcomes, obviously around their housing stability and their risk of homelessness, but then also in these broader other areas. So whether it's kids' educational outcomes and their ability to stay in school in a stable and, and, um, and beneficial way, it really affects people's credit reports because those lawsuits being filed against them or orders from the court often then can be found um, and used, whether it's by future employers, by future landlords, or other people when um, risk or credit worthiness is being assessed. The experience of being forced to leave your home also affects people's employment stability, often leads to job loss, and has major consequences for physical and mental health. And then of course, there's the broader neighborhood effects too, and whether neighborhoods are able to be resilient and have strong community connections. So we're very concerned at this broad system level about the eviction crisis. In our work, we've also been interviewing individual tenants as they're leaving an eviction courthouse. And we've been drawing some of the things that we've heard from people who are in the middle of an eviction process. So these are some visual representations of what we've heard as people are leaving a courtroom having just gone through an eviction hearing. In this case, it was in Arizona. One person told us, I just feel like a tiny little person in front of the judge who's like out of the Pink Floyd's the wall. Or an eviction hearing is like when you're going to a dentist appointment and you know you need to get a bunch of fillings and your teeth pulled. I don't wanna to have to go through the pain and the rigmarole and the transportation and the cost and everything. Another person told us, it's like a scorpion being eaten up by a thousand shrieking ants. There's too many of them and there's only one of me, the government, the landlord, the people that control everything you know. And then finally, you don't know if you're mad or if you're upset or if you're scared, there's always this kind of thing hovering above you. So these are just kind of what it's like to be in the middle of this anxiety about the lawsuit, about moving out of your home and all of these things associated with an eviction. So then let's turn to talk about possible ways to both mitigate these harms or to prevent these kind of eviction lawsuits and crises in the first place. So this past year has really accelerated the amounts of experimentation and new programs being tried to address evictions. So uh, these are being tried at the federal level as we'll hear about in the panel um, in a minute. And then also with local and state leaders experimenting with new models. So one area is kind of new programs and new services. This includes eviction diversion programs, which are usually um, a coalition of actors at a local level, often hosted at a court, but with legal services and social services and rental assistance combining to stop an eviction lawsuit and instead get the landlord and tenant to settle, um, stabilize the tenancy and avoid a court outcome. There are other new kinds of programs and services, for example, housing courts that are bringing rental assistance and social services into the courtroom and having more of a collaborative experience, new community navigators and mediators to help both tenants and landlords make sense of what the law is, what services are available, and how to navigate this system. There's new programs like in Tulsa, Oklahoma, a gold star landlord program, where there are incentives, trainings, education of landlords about how to improve tenant relationships, avoid evictions, and use the social services available. There are also many new coalitions at the local level of local funders and foundations, government agencies, social service providers, courts and legal aid, coming together to form coalitions to find strategic long-term solutions. And there are new technology tools to make legal services more available and the process clearer. 
At the same time as there are those programs and services, there's also a lot of new policies and laws that are being tried out and evaluated. So one obviously was the eviction moratoria. Before COVID, there had been um, bans, temporary bans on eviction in the form of moratoria when there was harsh weather or natural disasters. During the public health emergency, then there were both the federal and then local moratoria to put a pause on whether landlords could file for eviction or whether um, court orders could be enforced against tenants. There are also other ways to get more and better assistance to landlords and tenants. So right to counsel, increasing the amount for legal aid or court self-help services to get more of this kind of legal guidance available to more people. Also discussions about when the eviction system can be used. So setting up standards around when landlords can use the eviction system and possibly having a good cause or just cause rule where um, landlords could only bring a tenant to court if there was a lease violation and not for other reasons. There's also discussion about improving how the court proceedings go. These are usually summary proceedings that move very fast. So there's explorations of how to bring more due process and more ability for the litigants, even if they don't have a lawyer, to navigate the court process. To stop the downstream consequences, especially for credit reports, future employment, future rentals, there's exploration of new policies that would mask eviction records or expunge past eviction records. Um, and there's discussion about more oversight of the rental market and making sure that housing conditions, uh, fair housing laws, and other protections are actually being enforced. So that's kind of a brief overview um, of what is being tried out and being discussed to mitigate the harms of eviction. If you're interested in this, our, um, our Stanford Law School team has been putting together a website that goes into more detail on case studies. And you can find that at evictioninnovation.org and read a lot more case studies of what's being tried. Um, I'll say thank you, uh, but now go into a panel discussion. So I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to invite our four panelists to come on. Wonderful, great to see you. So I'll briefly go over who our panelists are before I kick off with a few questions. Then we'll be turning to Q&A. So you can feel free um, as um, in the audience to put questions in the Q&A. We'll be watching that and transitioning to your questions shortly. So on our panel, we have Peggy Bailey, who's a senior advisor in HUD's Office of the Secretary. We have Margaret Salazar, who's the executive director of the Oregon Housing and Community Services Department. We have Radhika Singh, who's Vice President of the Civil Legal Services and Strategic Policy Initiatives at the National Legal Aid and Defender Association. And we have Kyle Webster from Action Housing um, in Pittsburgh, where he's the general counsel. So let's get started. Um, I'm going to ask one question each, and then I'll be watching the Q&A to see what questions we have from the audience as well. So let's start with Peggy. Um, Peggy, so the federal government hasn't traditionally been in the space of eviction prevention. Could you let us know some of the things that the government has been trying and learning about how to respond to the eviction crisis, especially during the COVID um, pandemic? Absolutely. Thanks, Margaret. And hello, everybody. Uh, it's great to be with you all today. So, you know, so yes, yeah, so as, as Margaret's question um, alluded to, you know, eviction prevention isn't something that the federal government has had a, um, you know, an intentional response to. We've usually either dealt with trying to get as many people rental assistance as possible or dealing with the after effects like homelessness, um, but not, um, not addressed eviction prevention head on. Well, with the, so with the COVID crisis, this has allowed us to really lean into eviction prevention uh, in a uh, in a historic way that we're that that not only do we want to do now during this crisis, but we're trying to set up systems that can live on past the crisis and set up ways that um, st at the state, local, or federal level we can continue to resource these new innovations that um, that you're that you're going to hear about today and the ones that in, many of you are implementing locally. So the the White House has brought. HUD, USDA, and other federal agencies together in a whole of government approach to addressing evictions. Um, and at HUD, 
what we've done is first and foremost help Treasury implement the Emergency Rental Assistance Program. Um, uh, you know, Treasury uh, didn't have a, a deep resource, deep uh, um, a capacity to deliver to do housing programs at Treasury. So it's been um, great to have the expertise of Treasury of getting resources out to communities as quickly as possible but bring, being able to bring HUD's expertise on how do housing programs work at the local level and what are the best ways to deliver rental assistance um, to people. Um, we helped with the, um, with the uh, develop the, the frequently asked questions that Treasury has used to administer the program, um, particularly important for this webinar. Uh, the Office of Policy Development and Research played um, a huge role in helping Treasury think through um, formulas uh, and other and other uh, data points that were necessary for them to understand as they administered their program, and of and of particular unique expertise at HUD, our Office of Native American Programs um, worked hand in hand is work it has and is continuing to work hand in hand with Treasury to deliver the emergency rental assistance, pro the first program resources um, in Indian country and making sure that uh, tribal nations are able to use the resources um, and align those with existing housing resources. Also at HUD, we have a new um, program that, uh, that the Office of Policy Development Research um, is overseeing. It's a $20 million grant program for legal aid services. We just recently announced those grant awards. I can, uh, I or someone can put a link in the chat so you can see who the, the, the 10 communities that are receiving those resources, who they are. Um, and we're really excited about not only just simply leaning into uh, legal aid assistance and that important role that that community plays in eviction prevention and getting us closer to the day when more, um, when all tenants have access to legal assistance as they face evictions, but um, but what we'll be able to learn um, is are, are the best practices. Um, and in delivering that program, we're working really closely with the Department of Justice um, as well, who has really um, increased their uh, participation in uh, in in eviction prevention in a way that I think will also help us help us for the future. Um, the last piece is the data tracking that you saw uh, presented earlier. Um, you know, we just being able, just following uh, the data around evictions um, from the national level, and is something else that PDNR will be leaning into, fig trying to figure out how we at the national level can bring together the disparate uh, data sources at the local level when it comes to evictions. Um, is something that is of interest to not only the the president and the White House, but Congress as well. And we'll be um, we'll be doing more. Um, Congress has charged HUD to do more in that space um, too, so that we can really start to understand the problem because that's the key piece, right? All of us know that evictions were happening before the pandemic, um, and now we're we're um, uh, taking advantage of this unfortunate moment to shine a light on evictions and, and hopefully be able to do things that are more proactive and not seeing eviction as just a um, inevitable uh, uh, poor outcome of poverty, but something that can be addressed and fixed and not just fixed for tenants, but for landlords as well, because addressing eviction prevention helps uh, both, both actors in this space. Thanks, Peggy. Just one brief follow-up. Um, do you think that this federal government whole of government approach is just going to be while the pandemic lasts for however long that will be, or will this last beyond the emergency period? I'm confident that it's going to last beyond the emergency period. Um, uh, we've already continued to have uh, meetings around eviction prevention. Uh, we're all receiving regular data updates from outside partners who are monitoring um, evictions uh, nationally. Uh, and, and as I said, we at HUD have still have um, other initiatives that we have to, that we've been charged to implement by Congress. So, um, so I'm, I'm confident. And one of the, you know, good things is that with the emergency rental assistance, the second tranche of resources, there's a longer tail on being able to spend those dollars. And so it's not something that we're just looking at today. We want to make sure that every dollar that's been invested in eviction prevention is used as efficiently 
and um, effectively as possible. Terrific, thank you. Well, let's turn now to Margaret Salazar in Oregon and let's hear more about a local state um, lessons learned. So what have you been learning in Oregon so far um, and especially about the dynamics between ERAP, emergency rental assistance programs, vis-a-vis -vis eviction preventions. Um, what are you seeing? What's working? What's not? What lessons have you been learning? Great. Thank you so much, Margaret. And, and thank you to HUD for the invitation to participate today. So um, Oregon Housing Community Services is our state housing finance agency, but we also work all across the housing continuum from preventing and ending homelessness and utility assistance all the way through home ownership activities. We've been very busy as have our colleagues all across the nation, standing up and administering a number of emergency response uh, programs. And this year we have provided $370 million in rental assistance to Oregon landlords on behalf of their tenants through a combination of state uh, rental assistance programs funded with general fund and CRF dollars as well as, of course, the emergency rental assistance program. So we're at a point now where we have a ton of information about lessons learned. So the first thing I would just say is um, the lesson around infrastructure and capacity. And this is so, so important for folks to understand that building out uh, the emergency rental assistance program required the creation of an entirely new infrastructure for delivering resources at this scale and speed. So um, one just note about Oregon is that we got a little bit of a late start because we were running state uh, rental assistance programs that had their own time constraints. So we were a little bit late in standing up ERA, but we quickly rose to be a national leader. We are finishing out ERA one. Uh, we're almost uh, finished with that and we are now already beginning spending down ERA two. But building that infrastructure, I think was was humbling. So, you know, and I want to just tell the story because I think it's um, indicative of what's been going on nationally. Historically, the way that our state approached rental assistance was, was very much locally driven. There were pass through dollars that came through our state agency, whether they were state general fund dollars or things like ESG funds or home TBA uh, dollars. And uh, that model works really well when you pass dollars through to local agencies. They have relationships with landlords, they have relationships with tenants, they do case management, and they pair rental assistance with other kinds of benefits for residents, whether it's food services, utilities, whatever that might be. But what we quickly learned when we launched ERA was that that model was no match for what was going to be needed for ERA to deliver uh, rental assistance at the scale and speed that the public was demanding, as well as frankly, stand in for uh, eviction protections because our state has some eviction protections, but the overall eviction moratorium burned off, uh, expired, and suddenly ERA was the only option for folks. And so we quickly learned as we rolled out these dollars that we needed to add additional capacity. Our local program administrators um, simply couldn't staff up quickly enough in the middle of a labor shortage. So in addition to our local program administrators, we brought on an outside vendor and we have hired hundreds of staff, temp workers to call folks to help complete their applications outreach uh, folks, as well as folks to process applications. So standing this up in the, in the matter of just a few weeks, um, you know, was, was very, very challenging. And it's, we've added capacity along the way in, in waves. And I would just also say the admin dollars for this program absolutely were not sufficient to meet the scale and speed that the public was demanding. So that was one piece. The second thing I, I'll just um, add was the importance of really engaging in those community-based groups where they could add value the best. So what we found was the processing wasn't really working really well of actually processing applications and doing the paperwork, but when we can engage those community groups to do outreach to Oregon's diverse communities, communities of color, and be able to translate materials and have those that touch and that trusted partnership, um, including a partnership with the Oregon Health Authority with the groups that they use to help with the vaccine distribution and, and contact tracing. That was a really helpful partnership um, in, in place. But helping folks to understand that rental assistance needs to go hand in hand with eviction, um, eviction policy and eviction diversion programs has been very hard for our folks to understand. It's sort of rental assistance is the solution and Oregon is just now starting to grapple with how to build out a long-term eviction prevention and diversion system 
and our state is actually um, looking at a special legislative session next Monday, not only to add dollars to rental assistance, but to really think about how we can build out kind of an off ramp from ERA to have some eviction prevention uh, dollars uh, in place for folks. That's terrific, all that detail and those lessons learned. One follow up, when you look back and you think, especially through an equity lens, were there specific lessons learned either from the community-based organizations or at the state level about how to get that outreach to harder to reach communities or folks from different backgrounds? Yeah, so one of the lessons that we learned last year in administering the CRF dollars was that um, we had you know, local dollars going out to local community organizations with those trusted relationships, but tenants couldn't find the front door. And so that was something really important that we were sort of directing folks to their local program administrators. They were calling, they were getting busy signals, they were getting wait lists that were closed or open. So when we launched ERA, we, we, we kind of took a risk and we said, we're gonna have a very public front door. So everyone is gonna be routed to the same place to apply. We translated the materials into multiple languages and we got a flood of applications coming in. And the critique we heard before we launched was, you're not going to be able to reach communities of color. This is a technology gap. And so we sort of built in these sort of um, outreach folks. What we've learned was folks had no trouble finding the front door. Um, it was a very, very effective way to reach people. We were uh, really thrilled because we had real-time data with that front door that we are doing a great job of, reading Oregon, of reaching Oregon's Black and African American community and our Native American community. We are not doing a great job or as well as we need to do to reach our Asian Pacific Islander and Latinx community members. But because we have that real-time information, we can see that. And then we can develop new partnerships with Oregon's farm worker outreach community groups and things like that to be able to, to bridge those, those gaps. And so that was one piece. The second thing that we did was uh, we were very intentional that when we had a public front door that we didn't want to have a first come first serve process. We wanted to really build in a way to have a prioritization schema that took into account proxies for things like race and ethnicity and risk of eviction, really mark, uh, building on the slides that you shared about risk of eviction, family size, uh, and certainly the disproportionate impact on our communities of color. And so we used an Urban Institute racial equity index when we built out that system so that in real time, the applications are, are rated and ranked um, in the process. But I would also say that the final piece on this is we've had no trouble with application intake, that it has not slowed down. So we're just hitting this nerve of this latent rental assistance need that existed pre-COVID and you know, the, we actually don't really even need to invest that much in outreach because we're getting so many folks in the door. So those are just a few of the things uh, we learned here. Well, thank you so much for all that detail, Margaret. Well, let's go to Radhika and following up on some of these points um, from your work, um, what are you seeing on the ground, especially when it comes to diverting when folks are in that, almost having a lawsuit filed against them or being brought into courts? What kind of people are you seeing come in the door? What kind of scenarios are happening right now? Everything you can imagine would be my answer. But just really to, to maybe give some background to, to legal aid um, and legal assistance for, for folks who, who are on the call who may not know, um, I think a good, a good kind of measuring point is the Legal Services Corporation and the people served by grantees of the Legal Services Corporation. They serve people in every county in the country. Um, they provide the gamut of legal assistance, including housing, including healthcare, access to education, um, really all the things that you pointed out in your slideshow, Margaret. Um, and the at or below 125% of the poverty guidelines um, in 2021, just so, to put in perspective what that meant was, about $16,000 a year for an individual as their salary and about $33,000 for a family of four. So we really are talking about uh, the overlay of people who are immediately at risk or facing evictions um, and are homeless. And just to add one other piece to all of the things that housing stability underlies that you pointed out, Margaret, the other piece that housing stability underlies is actually people being pulled into the criminal justice system, which then sets off a whole new set of collateral consequences and people's ability to obtain and retain employment, um, healthcare benefits, all of the things that we're talking about with regard to economic stability. So I think that, you know, I think that um, 
people and, and kind of academia often puts housing in the social determinants of health category of economic stability, but it touches on every single category that we're talking about. Um, so, I mean, I think that that's an important part of considering why we care about eviction prevention, um, that it's easy to kind of look at the immediate piece and say we need to prevent evictions, but looking longer term at the health of our communities and the role specifically that legal services um, folks provide in, in really building up that stability and the ability to, to have strong and healthy communities. Um, I, the other point I do want to point out is um, the spectrum of legal services that are provided or legal assistance. So range every, from everything in terms of self-help, self-help, know your rights, um, which has been really important during this phase, right? When we've had various moratoria come out, um, ability to kind of raise defenses um, to halt a, a proceeding in court. Um, but then also the effect of full representation, which is on the other side of the spectrum, of course, but full representation in housing cases is really where we've seen the most effect. Um, and so I do wanna um, thank Peggy for pointing out the $20 million, the $20 million uh, in, in grants that really provide that full representation um, aspect, but also look at that self-help and how are we getting people through the door um, because we need that full spectrum. But just to, to say, before the pandemic, when we had full representation in legal services, um, that meant that in most cases, people were remaining housed or they had more time to move and find addition, you know, another place to have stable housing. They owed less in back rent, which affected all of those future conditions. And they avoided the record that you talked about, Margaret. Um, and so that's kind of why we feel like legal services is part and parcel of the solution. And to, to Margaret's point that emergency rental assistance and rental assistance is an important part, but there is another piece to eviction prevention. Um, and the I think the upstream pieces that you talked about um, or you asked about Margaret is really where we're seeing eviction diversion line. And the reason for that is if we can get interventions and often they are legal interventions, often they are mitigating um, habitability conditions, often they are mitigating and, and kind of negotiating back rent, helping people access income supports that can help provide the income to pay rent, um, right? That those upstream solutions never set off, that, the benefit of that is like they never set off a court process. Once you're in the courts and the process is moving, and I'm gonna give you a really stark um, statistic that we had come out recently from, from Richmond, Virginia, is that the majority of evictions proceedings, evictions hearings in courts uh, occurred in less than three minutes. They were over in less than three minutes. Um, that, was, that, was, that was an average um, of that. And that actually 40% were over in a minute. So really go with the quotes that you were talking about, Margaret. And so getting kind of legal assistance in there, um, you, you can see how that's kind of like the last resort when you're in court and you have a minute to prevent being put out on the streets um, is really stark. Uh, and then when you had legal representation, you were able to kind of slow down that process, look at more things that were happening, that yes, there is a basis for this landlord filing an eviction that the court can see and say, yeah, you have a basis for an eviction, but what are those deeper points that are coming in, into play? That's what we get to uncover in diversion processes and diversion programs and mediation. Right, without a court proceeding moving forward. Um, you talked about an eviction judgment, eviction filings on someone's record prevent their ability to gain stable housing. And so being able to kind of slow that down, look upstream, see when there might be something that could indicate. So I'm gonna ask HUD, PDNR, predictive analytics. <laughs> um, it's like my new favorite thing. You can look at predictive analytics and say, what are these predictors of people who might be at risk of eviction? And if we can get to them upstream and get them the services they need upstream, it includes the diversion part where you can negotiate with landlords and maybe you know mediate a problem, find new housing, but includes all of those other legal solutions where you can help people access income, where you can help them access healthcare, that can play into their housing stability. Um, so, I mean, I think that's where we are now. Um, Margaret talked about an off-ramp. I think that, um, you know, we saw a lot of eviction diversion programs built up with supplemental and emergency funding. And what we're looking at now is 
how do we sustain those programs and how do we make them better? How do we work? And it is gonna, it's gonna require some HHS resources too, I think, to look at social determinants of health, um, but where to find those pain points, I guess is what people like to say, um, where we can get our interventions earlier, um, I think is really where the future is um, and where the best investment right now is, is kind of looking beyond, I think it's an opportunity we have with this whole of government approach is to look beyond um, the immediate, you know, last resort, we're in court, we've got to fix something um, and get to people before they even get to courts. And Radhika, I mean, a question similar to one I had asked Peggy earlier, do you think that all of these eviction diversion programs, what's going on with collaborations locally and courts um, and legal aid um, kind of working together? Are those going to go away when COVID goes away, or are those kind of being built with sustainability in mind? I mean, so that's, well, we can ask Congress if they want to fund those. <laughs> but I think, um, you know, I think that there's a will to keep it going. I think that people have found the value in this, and 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 Margaret, you know, I mean, I think the we had a report come out this spring from the Harvard uh, Negotiation and Mediation Clinic um, that surveyed landlords, surveyed tenants, surveyed legal advocates, and the majority, 70% said, you know, these holistic approaches are where it works. So I think that there's a will, and we've had some pretty powerful summits where, you know, I never thought I'd get my legal aid lawyer to sit together <laughs> with a landlord representative and kind of come up with a holistic solution. I think we have a real opportunity and a real will to see how this works. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it's, it's up to us as a country to invest in those in those programs um, and learn from the best practices. You know, Margaret talked about what, what they learned in Oregon and kind of making it better. I think I would love to be able to say that's true with what we're seeing across the country, but it, you know, we have really transparent um, procedures and we have processes where you know, people can't figure out what's going on, um, right? And, and, and we know, you know we have the potential of you know, some of this money not being used when we know that it needs to be used. Um, so, I mean, I think it's just, it's for us to all come together as a country and say, we've learned that this is where our best practice is right now. Um, let's make a commitment to raise the bar everywhere. And then we can go from there. But I do think that is the future. I think that we have a will to do this. We had these pro some programs before the pandemic, and those were the states who were in the best position to deal with it, quite frankly, is because they already had these collaborations built. I do think it's multi-sector. I think it's cross-sector, um, whichever term you like to use, but it is government, it's landlords, it, it's everyone's legal advocates, I guess, need to get involved. <laughs> um, it's tenants, and honestly, it's the community organizations that Margaret talked about. I mean, that's really who needs to be at the center of this, is, and that's who we all need to be listening to, is what does the community want? Wonderful. Thank you so much for your insights, Radhika. Kyle, um, well, being both involved in emergency rental assistance and with landlords on the ground, I'd love to hear your thoughts about, at least in the Pittsburgh and Allegheny County context, what you're seeing about what small landlords um, are experiencing right now and how they are involved in eviction prevention efforts. Yeah, absolutely. So um, just to give some brief context, because I think I'm the one person whose employer is not totally obvious what it is. Um, Action Housing is the largest and oldest affordable housing nonprofit in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, we are a large developer, landlord, property manager. Um, you know, we also are the administrators of the emergency rental assistance program for Allegheny County and the city of Pittsburgh, which is the second largest county in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, but we have uh, you know, 2,000 um, tenants under our direct control, and we have a uh, uh, a portfolio that includes an additional uh, one to 2,000 other tenants that fall under our umbrella. So we are also a large scale landlord. Um, here in Pennsylvania, we had a program last year called the CARES Rent Relief Program uh, that, to Margaret's point, there was no infrastructure for. We had to build out an infrastructure, and in doing so, we learned a ton of lessons, and we saw a program that did not go nearly as successfully as um, our communities needed it to. Um, and so Action actually asked, as a landlord, to be in charge of ERAP once it was announced because we knew the importance of its success. Um, the landlord community is the one industry whose bailout was dependent upon third-party action and qualification. For us to get the money we needed to stabilize during this terrible time, 
our tenants who were already stressed, who were dealing with layoffs, who were dealing with, um, you know, suddenly have children at home, et cetera, they had to be the ones that proactively got documentation to nonprofits and government agencies and then followed up to get the qualification um, to get us the ability to be paid and stabilized. Early on, I spoke out about the fact that I really thought there should be a mortgage program to landlords that led to forgiveness in exchange for forgiving rent. Politicians don't like giving landlords things. Uh, it's not a popular uh, you know, segment of the population. Uh, Action Housing is a very unique landlord. We're the landlord that often is viewed as the not a real landlord landlord. So I get that I'm viewed differently as, uh, than other landlords. But the reality is, is you know, for us to get the money we needed to stabilize, we had to get our tenants engaged in ERAP, uh, which is why we wanted to make it successful. And I don't know the stats nationally, but in Allegheny County, more than two thirds of units are ma and pa landlords, meaning it is landlords with about three or less units. So the vast majority of the landlords in this um, region are landlords who one to two months of unpaid rent is devastating to their bottom line and leads to exactly what we're seeing happening. They're selling their properties to large corporate entities, many of which are not based in Allegheny County or even in Pennsylvania, who don't care as much about the lives of those here in Allegheny County and aren't as invested in ensuring um, eviction prevention. That's a long way of saying, you know, it's been a rough go for the landlords. I know that landlords are not the most sympathetic community, but it has been uh, tough. Here in Allegheny County, given that we knew that we needed ERAP to be successful, we did a lot of what Margaret said. We um, partnered with a lot of um, community organizations. Action Housing has 27 community and nonprofit partners working underneath us to help us implement this program locally. Uh, we have set up drop-in centers to uh, break down the digital divide. Uh, we have uh, made a lot of different accommodations to meet people where they are at. And that's because we want to ensure that both the landlord and the tenant can be stabilized. We also have a very strong partnership with the courts. Um, and we've, we've done a lot of really, really strong outreach with um, the landlord communities, the different uh, organizations to try to reach them. But just like some uh, communities um, you know, that are hard to reach on the tenant side, there are communities that are hard to reach on the landlord side. We have a large number of landlords who are over the age of 75, who have households that they have inherited um, and they are not people who have access to the internet. They're not people that have, um, you know, a lot of uh, ability to get to a drop-in center, et cetera. So we've done a lot to try to work with them because it is a hard time right now uh, to exist as a landlord. I mean, I, I get why landlords feel the need to evict right now. You know, it's because when you see your building on the verge of needing to be sold because you cannot afford to run it anymore, you don't really have any other option. And that is a thing that, you know, a lot of people are struggling with and are dealing with. And that's why it's so important that ERAP be successful in these other programs. I also would say ERAP has become the answer nationally. There are other programs. ESG should allow for homeless prevention in addition to rapid rehousing so that it can be a secondary resource to supplement ERAP. Um, that is something that I think, you know, we've been advocating for a lot at the local level. That is another resource that has been really limited over the last few months while we've been prohibited from using it for homeless prevention. So I would love to see that happen so that more landlords can be assisted and so that more people can have their housing stabilized, both as landlords and also obviously keeping the tenants housed. Um, that's a long way of saying, you know, again, it's been a very, very tough go, I think, for the landlord community. I think that you've seen a lot more landlords come to the table because the eviction moratoriums forced them to the table, um, which is fantastic. Uh, the way that we've been able to get through the last year and a half, I think, has been through that of collaboration. And that does mean having all of the players at the table. Um, at most tenant rights tables in Allegheny County, over the last five years, I am the one landlord. We've gotten to see that grow over the last year and a half, and that's been really exciting. And I'm hopeful that that's really sustainable because we recognize for housing stabilization programs to truly work, you need that landlord engagement and you need those landlords to be a part of the solution. Thank you, Kyle. I also wanted to ask about your experience, um, especially in the processing, managing ERAP, how you've been using data and tracking, building on Margaret Salazar's points from the Oregon experience. What's that looked like in Pittsburgh? Absolutely. So, I mean, that's one of the key things that we really uh, strove for on day one was we wanted every single thing to be tracked um, 100%. Uh, we wanted to know everything about both who we're uh, targeting, who's applying, 
how they're getting through the process, and also how our team is doing at helping and assisting them. That way, we've been able to make real-time um, targeted changes uh, in order to ensure that the program is successful. A great example of this early on is we realized that uh, we really had a disproportionate number of applications for individuals over the age of 62. There really were not that many in the first month. So we started doing some targeted outreach and targeted partnerships to try to bolster that, that number. Allegheny County is the second oldest in terms of median age county, uh, urban county in the United States. It doesn't make sense that our over 62 year old population was as low as it was early on, other than we weren't doing the right things to reach that population. So we started doing those really targeted outreaches and it was really a, a great success in terms of seeing that number uh, turn around. I do think a key thing in data usage is we've had to be humble. And that is so, so important. This is a new program. This is a new infrastructure. This is a new terrain. If I have ownership of my program and feel that everything I'm doing is right because I am the expert, I am failing. I need to be able to be informed by the data and informed by the community members who both have access to the data, but also have access to the front lines to tell me, hey, you may think you're helping this community, but you are failing them. And here's what you need to do to change. And so we use both those collaborations and that data to make those real-time changes to really ensure that we are reaching everyone and not just getting them into our system, but getting them out of our system. We want people to get stabilized. Our goal is to deny as few people as possible. Our denial rate right now is I think 1.4%. We have one of the lowest denial rates in the country. And we are incredibly proud of that because the reality is in this moment, it's hard. And the majority of people in need of this money legitimately need the money and qualify under the uh, criteria, which actually, you didn't ask about this, but I'm just going to say it really quickly. Two key things about ERAP that make it successful. It's one of the first programs I've worked on that I see from day one, there was ample admin allocated to the program. And that is so important to the success of a program. Nonprofits and government have to be able to build out the staff to a degree that leads to the success of the program. And then the second thing was, I wish it was lower barrier, but it is as low barrier as I think the government's willing to go. And I really appreciate that because I think that the important thing to acknowledge when you're helping people in crisis is you have to help them in a way that meets them where they're at. And people in crisis don't have the ability to overcome barriers because life is already itself a barrier. So I really do appreciate that about this moment. And I'm hoping that that continues beyond this moment. That's a great insight, Kyle. And maybe Peggy, if I could ask, in the whole of government approach, um, it seems that there was a conscious effort to kind of put people or consumers at the center. Could you talk a little bit more about that kind of focus on lowering administrative burdens, putting the tenants and landlords at the center and kind of how that was done by different agencies at the federal level? Sure. So, you know, primarily um, given the how huge the amount uh, of money there was for uh, the emergency rental assistance program. That's where I'll focus is how we, how we really thought about doing that through the emergency rental assistance program. Um, and luckily uh, we, uh, Treasury was given a, a good amount of flexibility in how they designed the program to allow um, us as the federal government to, to do that. And mostly, I think there are two things driving our, our thoughts on that, on this. One, as you said, we were, we were centering people and trying to get resources to people as quickly as possible and limiting the administrative burden to do that. We've learned lots of lessons, particularly in the homelessness space, about how hard documentation is in, the, uh, in particular and other barriers that we as the federal government often set up that make it harder for people to get the resources that they need. The second thing that we were um, lucky, we, that we've been able to be very explicit about given the president's focus in this area is the equity, particularly racial equity, but also for people with disabilities and others who can often find it hard to navigate systems, even being able to travel between multiple appointments to get different points of data on the uh, and the different ways that people um, live together uh, that can sometimes be cultural, that, you know, the leaseholder, um, there may be other people living with someone other than the leaseholder, for example, um, and that, that, but they're paying rent and they need to be, they need help paying rent in order to uh, stay uh, in the place that they're living and trying to look through those things because first and foremost, our 
our, our mission was to get rental assistance to the people who needed it the most as quickly as possible. And we just kept that uh, front and center. And it was um, really freeing to be able to kind of think through how to do that. And it took a lot of conversations. Uh, and you can tell from, especially uh, from, the, from the frequently asked questions that we really parsed out, like what exactly do we need to know for each ele program element? Um, because we do have a responsibility as a federal government to be good stewards of taxpayer dollars. Um, but um, alongside with that, though, what does it mean to be good stewards of the taxpayers' dollars? And, and that is both ensuring that the resources are spent the way that Congress intended, but getting them to the people who need it the most. Because if there's 40, you know, $46 billion out there and it goes unspent, what good have we, what good have we done? And, and how much trauma have we inflicted on people if we make them jump through a myriad of hoops to try to get um, help that for no fault of their own? That's great. And maybe if I could ask both Radhika and Margaret Salazar this question. Um, when we think about the programs part of it, so eviction diversion programs, ERAP, what are the laws or policies that you're seeing in different jurisdictions that you think might lead to kind of this longer term prevention or mitigation of harms of eviction? Um, kind of what's coming down the pike? Maybe, Margaret, if you can speak in Oregon, what you think is going to be discussed at that strategy session or what kind of laws? And then, Radhika, if you could talk at the national level. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, this is a really timely question here in Oregon because um, we had a, uh, in our regular legislative session, we had two bills uh, pertaining to eviction protection. So we had a statewide eviction moratorium that was in place until um, July 1 of 2021. And when folks were trying to look at that, that was this, uh, initially seen as kind of that off ramp period. I think folks thought that of course we'd be further along in the pandemic recovery than we are now. And so um, there was a law passed that gave tenants a, um, a grace period for paying back rent through uh, February 28th of 2022. But unfortunately what that did was set up July 1 as sort of this cliff where if you were behind on your current or future rent, you were facing eviction, which created a lot of pressure on the uh, ERAP program to suddenly focus on future rent, which is, was not the original program design. So there's been a mismatch there. And the legislature recognized that and passed a safe harbor period that if you applied for rental assistance, um, you, you had eviction protection for 60 days. But because of the huge influx of applications that we've gotten, that 60 day period has not been sufficient in our larger metro areas. And so the legislature is recognizing that and pivoting again. And so in the special legislative session that the governor has called for this coming Monday, uh, we're looking at a, a model that is built on successful eviction policies that are in place in other states that really tie rental assistance uh, to eviction protections, but don't have a, a sunset date, that 60-day artificial date would go away. So if you apply for rental assistance, whether it's through ERAP or some other program, and really noting uh, Kyle's point that there are other rental assistance programs as well, that um, you have protection until your application is resolved, either paid or um, deemed uh, ineligible. And so that would, that would create um, a lot more breathing room to get these dollars out the door. And at the same time, putting state dollars on the table to fund eviction diversion programs. So we're hopeful that that, um, that blend will, will, will work uh, from a policy perspective. And I think, again, making sure that the eviction policy marries well with the the requirements of the program, the, the rental assistance program is really, really important. And I think that's a lesson I hope folks have learned here in our state. So from the national level, I mean, I think the, the chance to kind of see what's happening across the country, I would point out kind of two promising movements. One is what that has been in effect for, for quite a while. And, and really I think we saw efforts and, and kind of momentum really take hold during the pandemic, which is the right to counsel movement. Um, and, and municipalities and, 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 and states understanding, mostly municipalities, mostly on the municipal level, but it's a big win when it happens on the state level, understanding what universal access to counsel does in housing cases. And those are the, those are the kind of the statistics and the impact that I mentioned earlier. And we've really seen kind of some of these resources. And I absolutely 
second Kyle's point on ESG, the Emergency Solutions Grant Program, um, and really kind of this understanding that we've tried rapid rehousing. Rapid rehousing is important, but permanent supportive housing is where we are now. We need to get people stable housing, and you know we need to refocus kind of our efforts on that. Um, but right to counsel is important because, again, whether you're in court or out of court, the, the ability to have a legal representative, I would say the first and foremost is that it slows down the process. I mean, we've seen in New York City where folks have had a right to counsel for a little bit now that eviction filings actually decreased simply because a right to counsel was put in place. Right. And I think that that can't be understated, the effect of that. And so that's kind of where our, I think our hope is. I think that, uh, you know, I, I know PDNR, I know HUD understands the importance of right to counsel. I think we're seeing it across the board now. I think we saw, you know, we've seen in, in various high level officials calls for legal assistance um, for to prevent evictions during the this crisis. We've 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 seen that and we're, we're encouraged by that. I think the other part of it, and it addresses, I think one of the questions that's come through um, is due process protections. I mean, I think that, again, due process slows down the, the process, right? You know, if, if we have to say that a tenant needs this amount of notice before an eviction can be realized and not just the notice, but the opportunity to cure, right? So um, for example, you know, I think the National Housing Law Project just put out a survey, um, re results of a survey this week, a couple of days ago, that said that, you know, people surveyed, the majority of people surveyed all across the country, and to be fair, legal advocates, legal aid lawyers, were saying that they saw an increase um, in evictions filings during this period, that they actually are beginning to see these increases regardless of the fact that people have access to rental assistance. Um, they've seen landlords uh, push forward with their filings while they're waiting for assistance. So that level of due process that says you have to wait until those funds are dispersed, if that application is pending, um, you know, that's a basic level that could actually be really promising, halt this, make the process a little more fair. Um, that's what due process is about, um, but it's really about slowing down. I think you can see both of those, both of those practices are really about slowing this down taking a look at what's really happening um, and addressing what we can outside of court. And if an eviction is appropriate, finding additional avenues for stable housing. Can I just add a little, a little landlord perspective to the right to counsel piece? Obviously I hate anecdotes as examples of anything, but the number of times that I have uh, handled an eviction for my agency where after we are granted possession, the person then breaks down in tears and says something to the effect of, my son just died of cancer. That's why I couldn't pay rent the last three months. How can you put me out? And at that point, it's too late. Like I, I've taken every effort. When one of my tenants is represented, there is someone who can talk to me and tell me what's going on. And that is so helpful because eviction is expensive. It's you know emotionally draining. It is not a fun thing for anyone to engage in. And I would rather not do it. I always try to make myself accessible to our tenants, but at the end of the day, I'm a cisgender white dude who often wears a suit, has a law degree, and works in downtown. I'm not someone who a lot of our tenants relate to, and they don't trust me because I epitomize basically the oppressors they've dealt with their entire life, and I get that. People who aren't intimidated by me or who do trust me, at least to talk to me, are the legal services attorneys at Neighborhood Legal Services here in Allegheny County. They don't hesitate to tell me what's going on and to have those conversations with me and it's so important to give tenants that access to have someone who can advocate for them, who speaks the same language and is not intimidated by the person who has the power to make them homeless. So from, from a landlord perspective, I know not every landlord would agree with me on this, but it is so much better to me when my tenants are represented because then I have a much better picture of what's actually going on so I can figure out if there's something legitimate I should be working with. And also legal services attorneys know the landscape of rental assistance and other resources. So they can help my tenants get the money to pay me to stabilize my building, which is also phenomenal. So I just want to give kind of a second plug on that. People often think uh, landlords are against that. I am an advocate for that. I think a lot of other landlords, especially in the affordable space, share that opinion because it makes life a lot easier because evictions are not fun. Thank you, Kyle, and thank you, Radhika, for your responses. Um, so now we're going to officially transition into question and answer. So please, you can use the Q&A function um, on the Zoom webinar. I'm going to 
queue up one question. So for those of you, especially for Margaret and Kyle, have you been tracking veterans, service members? Um, is that one of the demographic groups that you've been tracking about um, either risk of eviction applications for ERAP otherwise? Or Radhika, have you noticed anything about veterans and service members um, and their um, uh, like uh, any analytics on their involvement in eviction? No, I'll, I'll jump in a little bit. I mean, we have not, um, I don't think we've been expressly tracking that. I think it's a great question because we we do have, you know, so many active strategies right now to end veteran homelessness. And we have set aside dollars specifically on veteran homelessness. So I will take that one back uh, to my team because I think that's an important, you know, especially given the federal emphasis on ending veteran homelessness and, uh, you know, many states and localities have this sort of specialized resource, we can't overlook that. So I really appreciate that flag. I will take that one back. We have not tracked veterans, but I will say that we um, have done targeted outreach. Action Housing is actually the largest uh, owner of veteran-specific housing in Allegheny County. Uh, we have strong partnerships with a lot of veterans-based organizations in Allegheny County, and we have done a lot of very targeted outreach. I will be honest, um, we probably should have included that question. We got to the point where we were trying to make the application as short as was possible. So there was a lot of things that got scrapped that probably should not have been. Um, so we do not track that information, but we do have partnerships and targeted outreach to meet that population as best we can. Yeah, I think that actually the VA um, has some good numbers on this and I'm sorry, I don't have them on, on hand. Um, but I think that for the reason Margaret talked about, I mean, so the VA for, for a long time has had a program called the Supportive Services for Veterans Families um, program that has been aimed at providing and, and accomplishing um, housing security for veterans, for people, veterans and their families who are, who are at risk of or facing homelessness. And they have been tracking a lot through that. I do know that throughout the course of the pandemic, the Veterans Experience Office has been holding, um, I think what in the past they would, be, they would have held as stand downs, um, but kind of virtual stand downs. Uh, to reach veterans on this issue and, and many other issues. And, and you know, legal services have been a huge part of that, but it's a much broader piece to, to make sure that veterans have access to all the social services that can help stabilize um, you know, their families and communities. So I, to say, uh, we don't have numbers on that, but I think that there are numbers and like Margaret said, it, it goes beyond ERAP. Peggy, I don't know if you have anything to chime in or I'll move on to the next question. Yeah, I was just going to put in the chat that the VA, as Radhika mentioned, has a site on this in eviction prevention. I'm going to, I'll put it in the, I'll put it in the chat. So this question comes from Julia saying that watching eviction courts in Texas, there's a lot of variance about what's actually happening in courtrooms, how the laws on the books are translating into judgments or how the process is going. Radhika, is this a common thing or do you have any insights about how different courts can be held accountable and make sure the law is actually being followed? Other than getting a legal representative in there to make sure that they're, they're doing this. I mean, I think that this is a common thing. And I think part of it is because of the way our courts are set up um, is that, you know, not everyone has a unified court system. Um, there's, you know, very little, I think that beyond kind of civil rights um, violations and, and maybe, you know, basic due process violations, which I know this question raises, but I'll get to in a moment, um, that the federal government can do um, with regard to courts that are not federal courts. Um, and so when you have just, and again, justices of the peace are kind of pointed out here um, as well, but you know, we have uh, in various court systems across the country, um, people who are even less trained than justices of the peace who are making decisions about this. And so we've had um, during the course of the pandemic, for example, um, people who would come in with a certification that they, you know, when, the, when there were moratoria in place, um, you know, saying that they were impacted by COVID and so they are eligible for the moratoria and they should stay the case. And they immediately, the justices immediately put them into proof of certification hearings, um, right? And so I, I would say, you know, I know it's not comforting, Julia, but we, we are seeing this across the country. I think that is the importance that a legal advocate put, can do. And I do think that it's important um, it just underlies the importance of due process looks different across the country. And so we need to set that standard of what that notice is, that's required is um, and what kind of that is. And once we have that, um, then we can challenge it. Um, and I know that, you know, folks in various agencies are interested in learning about that, but 
um, you know, I think that right now, if what you're seeing, I would say what we're focused on is when we're seeing it play out disparately, we're seeing it play out across protected classes, that that is our best argument for fighting that. And that is what happens in housing. I mean, you saw the, the statistics that you pointed out, Margaret, right? I mean, people of color, um, people along gender lines, right? I mean, just because of the history of this country, there is a disparate impact that you're seeing with regard to evictions. And you know, if you see biases in the way the justices are acting, that's another good case to make. Um, but that's really what, where I would say, without these basic due process standards, that's where we are. Thanks. For the next question, I'm actually going to combine one from Luciana and one from Anne, and I'm going to direct it to Margaret and to Kyle. Um, so what, when we're thinking about um, preventative services, getting to people before the lawsuit, um, do you have uh, recommendations to local governments about what community partners that maybe are not traditionally on the radar, not your typical social service or housing counseling groups, to do that outreach and to kind of increase the amount of counseling that can get to landlords and tenants um, before they go towards the more adversarial eviction process? So I can say um, just one thing I'm pretty passionate about, and um, I, I want to acknowledge the fact that I really value my government partners and I recognize that I'm on a call organized by the government where I'm mildly critiquing the government, um, but I am very, very, you know, um, you know, appreciative of, of the government support that Action Housing has had the privilege of receiving. That being said, government funding structures for small organizations is not sustainable. Um, a reimbursement model for a community organization that is minority led, that has one staff and 10 volunteers is not a model that will ever work for them. And for eviction prevention to work, we need them at the table. What Action has been able to do through ERAP is we created a stipend program where we receive the money from the government and then we pay a guaranteed monthly stipend to these 27 nonprofits. So they have predictable guaranteed income that cannot be canceled with, with the exception of we, we, we can cancel with two to three months notice depending on the circumstance, but they have substantial leeway to know that so that they can plan accordingly for staff and other things. The majority of our government contracts that we receive and that are put out there really do require a reimbursement model or a fee for service model that just does not bring to the table the right community groups that need to be at the table for this work to be successful. So what unique groups are there? I mean, the one thing I would say, I can name them here in Allegheny County. Um, I can't name them everywhere, but basically, is there a historically uh, black neighborhood in your community that has a really um, amazing group of people who come together, maybe no employees, maybe they're all volunteers, maybe they have a small storefront where they give out food, et cetera. That's the group you want at the table. That's who you want to be a, a, a paid part of your team so that they are receiving the compensation necessary to build out to help and support these initiatives. Um, so that they can offer you the candid feedback necessary to ensure that you're reaching the population that they're so good at reaching um, and to ensure that they continue to exist because they need resources to continue to exist. Um, so that's a key thing I would say, you know, in, in terms of our modeling moving forward, once ERAP runs out, I hope that those sort of stipend models or something innovative like that that can properly fund these smaller groups can continue or can be created uh, by the government funders. Um, I will I will add on to that. And Kyle, as a as a as a government employee, I will just say that was the nicest critique I've I've had in uh, several months. So um, so I appreciate that. Um, but I would add to that I think a couple of things. So one is I think it's wonderful that the conversation has shifted so that there's a recognition that um, eviction for non-payment of rent um, is is something that folks can't can't stomach. I mean that is just that is an evolution and we should just acknowledge that we're at that moment and we need to build out this infrastructure to be able to create those community supports. So I totally agree with everything that Kyle just said and I'll add a couple of things, which is um, flexible funding is so important. Um, you know, one example we had from a community organization which is like, you know, I may just need to help somebody fix their car so that they can get to their job so that they can get their paycheck so that they can pay their rent. Um, it, you know, so sort of, sort of, you know, again, this massive rental assistance model that we're standing up and delivering right now has been a, a, a lifeline for so many people, but we all know, even with self-attestation, how much documentation is required and we're specifically just paying for certain things. So the flexible dollars, you know, that we use through, through ERA for the housing support services, being able to kind of 
whether it's ho housing counseling or these other kinds of support services uh, are so important. And a couple of other things I'll mention. So I mentioned that we had a partnership with the Oregon Health Authority. So they had built a network of community-based organizations that they had funded with flexible dollars to do contact tracing, vaccine outreach, and other, other sort of support services during COVID. And we just layered on for an intergovernmental agreement to get dollars out so that those, I mean, when, when those community organizations are talking to folks, they're talking about everything. They're talking about housing and health and all of these other matters. So finding a way to kind of, again, be part of these interagency conversations so that we're not siloing a, the housing program from everything else is really important. There's a ton of utility assistance out there right now through the additional LIHEAP dollars that we got through the American Rescue Plan Act. There's new water assistance out there. There's a lot of utility assistance. So bringing the utilities into the conversation I think is also important. And then I also just wanna flag something that we haven't talked about today, which is that rural looks really different. So we're in a, uh, this conversation right now about you know where we go forward in our state and, and this potential off-ramp idea. And folks are saying, how can we replicate what's happening in Portland and, and Eugene? You're not gonna replicate that exact model in a rural community in Eastern Oregon. It's going to look different. It's gonna look different on the reservations. It's, gonna, it's just gonna look different in our various communities. And so we have to, as Kyle was saying, invite those community partners to the table about what courtroom payments looks like, what that upstream prevention looks like. And, and this is the challenge that we're all facing is that we're in a moment where everybody wants these decisions and these programs to be operational yesterday. There's no time. So it is incumbent on all of us to fight for the time to have the right conversations with the right people in the room to build out this infrastructure in a way that's effective and sustainable. Well, that's great. I know we're at very limited time. Peggy, I'm gonna go back to the beginning of the questions from Owen. This question's for you. Is HUD planning to make any of the COVID policies permanent features of their forbearances or loan agreements? So um, in that space in particular, you know, for HUD, it's really dependent upon where, what our authority, where our authorities lie. Um, and uh, so if, if you're talking about uh, the things that we can do on uh, the, the single family side, I think you know we're, we're trying to think about what that right balance is between making sure that we're uh, preventing, um, you know, there's, there's a couple of, uh, you know, with limited time and not being able to ask you more about what your question is, right? There are the things that we can do to protect mortgagees and people who own single family homes or things that we can do to protect renters in single family homes, I think, um, you know, a lot of what we're doing is trying to, uh, is, is replicating the, um, the eviction moratorium that were uh, established for, uh, for renters generally to protect renters as much as we can in single family um, dwellings. But, um, but, uh, but most of our, but our focus really is on getting rental assistance to those, um, those who are eligible to make sure that they can stay, uh, stay housed. Great, thanks, Peggy. And let me try to sneak in one more question. Let me start with Radhika. Can inspection services like health and building inspectors play more of a role in slowing down evictions? Well, I guess that's what ESG is, is meant to help address. But I mean, I think, yes. I mean, so, and one of the things that we're kind of seeing too, and, and that, that the National Housing Law Project survey that I mentioned earlier covers this a little bit, is that non-payment of rent is not the only reason that landlords can cite to, to evict, um, right? And it's not the only way that an eviction happens. Court is not the only way that an eviction happens. So, you know, we, we do see places where landlords, you know, because and it's happened during the pandemic where, you know, they have a stay on their court case because, and, and I'm not, I'm not trying to bad mouth landlords. I hear you, Kyle. I do. And everyone else on here. I mean, where they have a stay on the court case because, you know, emergency rental assistance is pending or, or coming through where, you know, there's what we call an informal eviction, um, right? Where they withhold improvements to the, to the, to the dwelling. Um, right. And so they make it uninhabitable. And and when you think about, you know, the people I mentioned, an individual who makes less than sixteen thousand dollars a year. Imagine what uninhabitable looks like to that person. 
where they are forced out because they cannot live in, they cannot remain in that dwelling. And it, it, we've seen it in utility shutoffs, um, but we also have seen it in, yeah, like these, these lack of improvements. We also know, again, um, and we know this actually from the medical legal partnership um, field for, for quite a while, um, is that when we're talking about our healthy communities and social determinants of health, a basic inspection would reveal mold in an apartment where people are actually staying um, and becoming ill, right? Um, so, I mean, I think that investment in inspection, sure, there's a role to play. Um, there's a role that could be played before an inform that could halt an informal eviction um, in that um, in that sense. I mean, I think that the answer is is yes, but I, you know, the other thing is it, it kind of just goes back to Peggy's point where this is a whole of government um, solution, but it's a whole society solution where it's just there's a little role that everybody plays here, and one is not a holistic piece. So, you know, I'd be, you know, I'd be a little wary of saying that's where our investment needs to go, but certainly um, it can play a role and it, it can address that little piece that I just talked about. Well, I think we are at time. I'll thank all of the panelists for all of your wonderful, detailed and insightful responses. Uh, and thanks to the audience for your questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them. So I'm gonna hand it over to Todd Richardson for closing remarks. Um, thank you all once again. Thank you, Margaret. First off, I'd like to thank Dr. Margaret Hagen for keynoting our presentation today and moderating the panel. And I also thank Radhika Singh, Peggy Bailey, Kyle Webster and Margaret Salazar for their great panel discussion. If you all humor me for a second here, I want to summarize some of what I just heard. So the COVID generated eviction crisis has prompted federal, state, local, legal community and landlords to think differently about how we address missed rent payments and evictions. And it is this kind of new thinking that's creating the types of radical innovations. And I say radical here because this is big changes for how we run our programs for program invitation that Margaret Salazar and Kyle Webster highlighted. I was also struck by Radica's note that tenant council and landlord council are finding some common ground on how to address a holistic strategies so that we can sort of tackle some of these problems upstream. Even with that, tenants need more legal education and protections. I was equally struck by Kyle's point that absent landlords getting paid, they will sell. And this is my reading into this, that's likely to drive up rents and reduce affordable supply. At the federal level, I have very much enjoyed working with Peggy as she's worked tirelessly with Treasury to help make ERA as low barrier as possible. And it was nice to hear from Kyle that seems to have helped with implementation. So thanks again to our great panel. I'm gonna shift gears here. From a HUD 10,000 foot level, this is a moment of great challenges and great opportunity. Rising rents of 12 and a half percent in the past year with falling vacancies, home price increases of nearly 20% and declining supply of new housing for sale. These issues combined with stubbornly high missed housing payments and evictions are great and complex challenges. That said, the combination of CARES Act and American Rescue Plan, both HUD's $23 billion and Treasury's $46 billion, along with the potential of over $150 billion in Build Back Better, these resources married with a growing economy and the thoughtful creative policies that we just heard about at the state and local level are great opportunities for us to actually solve these challenges. So I'm gonna close out with a plug for HUDUser.gov where I think we can find insights, additional insights on how to tackle many of these challenges by looking at our past and current research. We also have more information on topics we covered today. If you want to get more information on our feature topic, our summer edition of Evidence Matters, you can see I have this as a handout here. Um, we also have our monthly housing market indicators report. That's something we started in 2008 with the foreclosure crisis. It's got data points. Um, as Veronica noted, those, we're now adding Pulse survey, survey uh, data points in that monthly piece. So if you want to see what the Pulse survey is saying about housing payments, look to the housing market indicators report each month. And as Kevin Kane showed, both the sales and rental marks, markets are in a state of rapid change. We are constantly updating our national, state, and local data on the changes at HUDUser.gov under our U.S. Housing Market Conditions tab. 
So I want to thank all of you for sharing the last couple of hours with us today and be on the lookout for HUD user for our next quarterly update, which will be in the first quarter of 2022. Thank you all.